The Christ candle is a sign to us that Jesus Christ has come into this world as the eternal light. The fellowship candles remind us that Jesus' people are the people of light in this world. As we light the Christ candle, let us hear the voice of Jesus say, I am the light of the world. And as we light the fellowship candles, let us also hear the voice of Jesus say, you are the light of the world. Thank you, Lily. Good morning. Good morning. A warm Ebenezer welcome is extended to everyone worshiping with us today in person or on Zoom. It is the second Sunday in Lent and the last week of Black History Month. Here are some highlights from the announcements. We'd like to thank Jane and Marilyn for refreshments following the service. Uh, on Monday, February 26th, is the affordable fresh food market between 2.30 and 4 p.m. Come out and get some fresh vegetables and sometimes some fruits. The board meeting will be on Tuesday, February 27th at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. And if you're interested, you can ask um, Joan for the link. On Wednesday, February 28th is the second session of the Lenten study, book study from se at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And uh, Reverend Forrester will talk a little bit more about it. The annual general meeting is on March the 10th after church. Mark that in your calendar. All members and adherents are encouraged to attend this important meeting. And um, in the community, there's a free tax service available for low-income families. The Al Ikram Foundation, they're offering a free tax service on March 17th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Millikan Mills Library at 7600 Kennedy Road. And it's a free service. If you have a low income, you can get some more information from your bulletin. And I will now ask Jane to come up and speak. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to say thank you very much to everyone who came to walk yesterday, who did some fundraising because I know how hard that is, and showed up and supported the team and supported Blue Door in our coldest night of the year walk. Um, the chief operating officer for Blue Door did walk with us and she just wants all of us to know how much they really appreciate the partnership that we have with them and the money that we've raised to help them. Because this is their big, um, what they've raised in coldest night of the year is what they really use to keep the programs running, like the coldest night, or the out of the cold program that's here. So thank you all very much. And it's not too late, so um, you can collect donations if you have anyone that says, oh, I forgot I was going to donate to you. Just send them your link, and we can go right till March 31st. So if you run into anyone that, you know, has wanted to donate to you, then we can still continue to do that. So, and the, you know, when we think about reaching out to the community as part of our mission statement, that we want to reach out to the community, I think this is a way that we can really reach out and by walking, we show people that we're here and we have our signs. And I think it just trying to keep us all going is a really important thing. And at the end of the service, when we see reach out to others, I think by putting our feet on the ground and walking yesterday, that's how we show. Um, the heart of Ebenezer. So, 
thank you everyone for everything. Take some time after the service to read the full details of the announcements from the e-news or your bulletin. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please stand as you're able, and we will join responsively in the call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, for praise befits the upright. Happy are we when we trust in God and believe in the testimony of his Son, Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Here in God's presence, then, let us leave behind thoughts that limit and the unholy thing that offends, and let us worship God together. Remain standing for the hymn of praise, I Love to Tell the Story, Voices United 343.
invocation together. Most holy and righteous God, we come into your holy presence, bringing you an offering of praise and worship. We celebrate in the knowledge that your mystery embraces the vast reaches of the universe, and yet you are present with us in our daily lives. Today we pray that you might deepen our sense of your holy presence with us always. Open our minds to wonder at creation, yet knowing that we can never fully grasp your mystery. Open us to the movement of your Holy Spirit, leading us into new possibilities and new life in our community and beyond. Be here with us, we pray, and move among us so that your name may be praised both among us worshiping together today and in all those places we may go this day and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And the confession will be responsively. Merciful God, although following you brings joy, we confess the way is sometimes hard for us. There are times we get tired and would eagerly settle for an easier road. Some days we find the task of loving others hard. Sometimes we choose anger over forgiveness or ignore the needs of our neighbors. Forgive us when our commitment to you wavers. Forgive us when we take the easy path and shrink from and shun the righteous path. Stir the smoldering embers of our devotion and kindle in us the flame of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen our determination to follow where you lead and renew our energy to serve Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Friends in Christ, believe the good news of the gospel. We are justified by God's grace which has come to us through Jesus Christ. By grace, we are forgiven and set free to find new life in Christ. To all who turn to the Lord then, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Thanks be to God. The Lord's Prayer.
My friends, we have come to the final Sunday of the month of February, which also meet, means we mark the final recognition, if you will, or celebration, if you will, of black history for this month, for this year. And as such, we have a very short uh, video clip just recognizing two notable black men in Canadian history. And we can listen to and watch that clip now. Since the early beginnings of Canadian history, people of African descent have made significant contributions to the development of our great country. Elijah McCoy was one of the most prolific black inventors of the 19th century, with more than 57 inventions to his credit and from whom we get the expression, the real McCoy. Since the early beginnings of Canadian history, people of African descent have made significant contributions to the development of our great country. William Hall became the first Canadian sailor, the first Nova Scotian, and the first black to receive the Victoria Cross. Celebrate our proud heritage. Celebrate Black History Month. And there is a song for the young, I have decided to follow Jesus. Seated everyone, may I invite the kids to come forward at this time. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good. Good morning, bigger boys and girls. Good morning. How are you doing? Wonderful. I am glad to hear that. Now, there are two words I want to talk about, but one in particular. And there are two words that are very, very, very important. One has three letters and one has two letters. And we say them every day. We say the word with three letters to things that we like, and we say the one with two letters to things that we do not like. We say the one with three letters to the things that we want to do, and we say the one with two letters to things that we do not want to do. Can anyone guess what those two words are? Yes and no. Yes and no. Give her a hand. Yes and no. So, 
as we talk about yes, we say yes to Jesus. Can anyone tell me why we say yes to Jesus? Or guess, why do we say yes to Jesus? Anybody? We say yes to Jesus, we say yes to God, why? Well, because Jesus created us. God created us and we should do what God says that we should do. And we should want what God says that we should want. But we must also learn to say no to somebody else. And who is that somebody else? Satan. Satan. We must say no to Satan because Satan wants us to do bad things, right? Satan wants us to hate each other, to fight with each other, to be mean to each other. And as we are in the season of a four-letter word, who remembers? Lent. Lent, yes. As we are in the season of Lent, we must practice always saying yes to Jesus and no to? Right. But we must also say no to somebody else. Can anyone guess who that other person is that we should practice saying no to at times? That's a big one. Your friends? Uh, yes and no. Anybody else? Who else must we practice saying no to sometimes? All right, how about the bigger boys and girls? You want to give it a shot? Who, must we pra who else must we practice saying no to sometimes? Nobody? Our selves. Because you know why? Yes, give her a hand, eh? Yes. We must practice saying no to ourselves because sometimes we also don't want to do what Jesus wants us to do. We also don't want to listen to Jesus and follow Jesus' commands. Sometimes we don't want to listen to our parents. Ever been tempted to do that? To not listen? Of course we are, right? And sometimes we want to do things that we are not supposed to do. For example, any examples? We want to do things that we are not supposed to do? Like watching TV when you should be doing your schoolwork, right? <laughs> what else? Huh? Or we're eating candies when you're not supposed to be eating candies, right? Yeah? Or we go into the refrigerator and we take things out when mommy and daddy said no, correct? Yeah. So there are times when we want to do things that we are not supposed to do. So as you go through this season of Lent, I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus, no to Satan, and no to ourselves. I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to say a short prayer. Your toy is right there, don't leave it, okay? Bow your heads with me and let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my neighbors. And thank you for everything that you give to me, that you give to my family, that you give to my friends, and that you give to my neighbors. Help me to say yes to you, and no to Satan, and no to myself. In your name I pray, amen. All right, you may go to Sunday school.
Please listen to the prayer for understanding. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit to move in us and among us so that we may hear your voice speaking in the scriptures. Open our minds and hearts to encounter the living Christ and give us the courage to follow him no matter the cost. We pray this through the glorious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 17, reading verses 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout the generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people, peoples shall come from her. Now for the reading of the New Testament from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are set in your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their, their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. God. I invite you to bow your heads with me and let us pray just one more time. God of all ages, we come recognizing again that the entrance of your word brings light and life to us. So again, we pray that you will illumine our beings with your word read and spoken and you will let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight O god our strength and our redeemer 
Amen. So I greet you again, everyone. Greetings to those watching online as well today. I just want to briefly make mention of our Lenten study coming up again on Wednesday and will be every Wednesday until March 27 at 7 p.m. This past Wednesday, we studied and talked about, discussed the first three chapters, and uh, this coming Wednesday, we will be looking at the next three chapters. Feel free to join us. Uh, if you haven't received a link for joining us, you may email me or email Susan in the office, and we will send you a link to join us for the study. All are invited and welcome to join and to share. Come with your questions, come with your queries, come with your insights, come with your comments, come with your full self to engage in a time of lively and exciting discussions as we look at the book Autopsy of a Deceased Church, 12 Ways to Keep Yours Alive. So today, we focus on the text that was read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 31, and more specifically, on the theme or the topic, the way of the cross, the way of the cross. Now, one might say, why are we talking about the cross already? And we are not yet into Holy Week. We are not yet into Good Friday, we are not yet into Easter. Well, we talk about the cross all the days of the Christian life. And the reason we talk about the cross all the days of the Christian life, because without the cross, our faith would make no sense. As a matter of fact, without the cross, we wouldn't have the faith that we have today. We wouldn't celebrate the faith that we have today. We wouldn't live in the faith that we have today. The cross made it all possible because through the cross, you and I came to that place of believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is also Lord and Savior of the world. So as we look at this text and we contemplate this discourse between Peter and Jesus and the rest of the disciples and the crowds that were there. There are four things that I wish to start off with concerning what it means to follow Jesus. Because when we talk about the way of the cross, that's what we mean. That's what we talk about. The way of the cross is following the path that Jesus took when Jesus was here on earth, the example that Jesus set for us when Jesus was here on earth, the life to which Jesus called us when Jesus was here on earth. And this life, this path, they are marked by four things, I believe, as we see from the text. And the first one is opposition. The first one is opposition. And where do we find opposition in the text? Well, as Jesus spoke, we heard Peter got up in remonstration and rebuked Jesus, saying, far be it from you, Lord. Jesus was there telling him that he must suffer many things, that, telling them, rather, that he must suffer many things, that he must go to the cross, that he will be killed, that he will suffer the most gruesome and barbaric death. He will be humiliated. He will be scourged. He will be mocked. He will be scorned. He will be persecuted in the highest order possible. But Peter, in his reverence for Jesus, could not imagine that Jesus would really have to go through this. Because if we read the text in its fullness, just before this happened, Jesus asked his disciples the question, 
Who do people say that I am? Do you remember that? Who do people say that I am? And some of them said, well, some say that you're Elijah. And I guess, you know, the kids in class, you know, they think they know the answer. So they were happy. Their hands went up very quickly. Well, some say that you're Elijah. And Jesus didn't respond. Some say that you're Moses. Jesus didn't respond. Some say that you're one of the prophets coming back from the dead who came back from the dead. Jesus was not impressed. You know, teacher having teaching you all these months and all these years, and now the teacher is testing the knowledge that you should have had. And the kids in the class, so to speak, are very excited. And all the answers fell flat. So Jesus turned to them and said, okay, okay, I don't fault others for not knowing. Let's hear what you know. Who do you say that I am? Oh, the class was silent. Silent, you could drop a pin and hear it from a mile. That's how they were silent. And then, of course, you know, Peter, very precocious, uh, a rambunctious individual, you know, uh, always up in the face. Peter jumped up and said after he realized nobody was speaking, but very timidly, and almost as though he was not too sure. Well, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to Peter, well, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven just now revealed this to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So having come to that recognition and being highlighted as a star, so to speak, in the class, the brightest kid in the class now, Peter now felt that he could give Jesus counsel. You know, they, we have a little saying that familiarity breeds contempt. You're familiar with that saying, right? Familiarity breeds contempt. So now you feel that you're up to the level of the master, right, Peter? You feel that you have come to that place where the Christ, the, the son of the living God, you can now give counsel when just a minute ago you weren't even sure who he was. Far be it from you, Peter said. This cannot happen to you. Even though this son of the living God, this Messiah, this man before them was just telling them exactly what was going to happen. It wasn't first that Jesus was telling them what was going to happen. But Peter couldn't imagine it. Peter couldn't imagine his life being without Jesus. So one of the first things that you and I will find when we seek to follow the way of Jesus is opposition. We will be opposed. We will be opposed for our ideas. We will be opposed for our vision. We will be opposed for our stance on faith and righteousness and holiness. We will be opposed when we seek justice and liberty. We will be opposed when we seek and attempt to be peacemakers within the community. We will be opposed when we seek to do good in the name of Christ. A cross was used to execute criminals who had the state of Rome in opposition of them. But not only will we face opposition when we seek to follow Jesus, we will be met with shame. The cross is a symbol of shame. Peter couldn't imagine Jesus being embarrassed like this because only the worst of the worst was crucified on a cross. For the saying goes or went like this, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree, meaning hung on a cross. This execution was reserved for the worst criminals. And the victim was usually naked on that cross for hours. 
in a culture where clothing and covering of oneself was regarded as dignified, if not sacred. Jesus was led to this reality. And Jesus says, if any would come after me, let them take up their cross. In other words, prepare to be embarrassed on my account. And one might say, but why would God want us to be embarrassed? Well, one of the things I learned growing up is that it was not easy to steal the thunder of others who were usually more popular than you were. For when you get to that place where it seems as though your star was now going to be shining brighter, I remember those kids, they would do everything to defame you. They would do everything to make the other kids laugh at you. They would do everything to ensure that you didn't come now and take their place as the popular kid. They would scheme. They would plot. They would do all manner of things. And it's, it's not only reserved to kids. We find it in the workplace. If you are the rising star, be rest assured that others who might feel that you might get the promotion before them or ahead of them might seek to do things to undermine you just to ensure that you do not get there. It happens in families, where there are jealousies in families. And so sometimes we find that even among siblings, one set of sibling, or it might be one sibling or two, cannot stand the fact that your kids might be advancing educationally and are finding success. I don't know if it happens in your community or in your culture, but I've seen it over and over again, where instead of celebrating your kid's success, they would rather put down your kid. When we seek to follow Jesus, we can be rest assured that we will be encountering, encountering rather, that thing called shame. There are those who would want to put us to shame. There are those who would want to make it seem as though we are cuckoos. There are those who would want to make it seem as though what we are trying to do or what we are following, we are simply peddling that which is dishonorable. There are those who would want, us to make, want to make us feel ashamed of what we believe in and they call our faith, they refer to our faith in all manner of ways. It has gotten so bad that the Christian church has shrunken from its place in society. We are no longer bold people. The church no longer boldly proclaim Christ. The church has, be, has become so ashamed of being Christian that we don't even like to preach the name of Christ anymore. What we seek to do instead, instead of emulating Christ, instead of following Christ, we seek to emulate the society. We seek to do what the society wants us to do as opposed to doing what Jesus wants us to do. So if the society disagrees with us, we shrink from our mission and we say let's adjust ourselves to ensure that the society is not upset with us. But it shouldn't be like that for the church. For the church has been given a prophetic role in the society, in the world. We are called to speak the things that people will not like to hear. We are called to do the things that will upset others. Not because we want to upset them, 
But when we stand for righteousness and holiness, and we have to call them out, when they're being unrighteous, when they're not living right, when the world is at each other's throat, and we have to call people to be peacemakers, when the world is driven by greed, and we have to call people to be caring and sharing with one another, to look out for the less fortunate and the needy. When the world is, is wrapped up with a hunger for power, and we have to call people to be humble, to see the other person as more important than yourself, and the other person's needs as more important than your own needs. When the world like it was in the time of John the Baptist calling out a wicked ruler and because that wicked ruler did not want to be held to account the prophet so to speak was put to death. So it is today that they will seek to destroy us, to shame us into silence. But we challenge the church today that if we are going to follow Jesus, then we have to be prepared to be put to shame. But not only are we opposed and shamed for following the way of the cross, we are given to suffering. We will suffer for the sake of the cross. This kind of execution was designed to prolong excruciating pain. So whenever anyone was hung on the cross, it is said that they slowly suffocated for hours and hours and hours as the weight of the body drags on the lung while the arms are stretched diagonally up on the cross. It was one of the most brutal and excruciating experience that anyone could have. And Jesus says, well, if they did it to me, how much more Will they do it to you? Now, I want us to step into Jesus' mindset here. Because when Jesus was saying, if they did it to me, he wasn't just speaking of himself as a mere mortal. As a matter of fact, Jesus wasn't a mere mortal. Jesus was and is God in flesh. The one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who created human beings. And Jesus was saying, then if they can do what they will do to me, then what will they do to you? Whenever we serve Christ, it means that we're going to have to put up with all manner of things that we otherwise would not be subjected to. It means that the enemy will come after us even more so now for Satan doesn't attack those who are already in his fold. But Satan goes after those who are not within his fold. I usually say to fellow Christians, if your Christian life is easy, Examine yourself carefully. If your Christian life is without opposition, examine yourself carefully. If your Christian life is without suffering, suffering that calls you to recognize your dependence on God, your need for God, your need to fall prostrate before God and seek God's help, then examine yourself carefully. If Jesus had to pray as earnestly and as frequently as Jesus had to pray, then how much more will we need to pray?
And finally, the way of the cross is marked with death. So we talk about opposition. We talk about shame. We talk about suffering. And finally, we talk about death, the ultimate. And one might say, but why would I die for following Jesus? Well, let's talk about death first of all in a metaphorical way. Or if you'd prefer, in a spiritual way. The Apostle Paul says that we must die to self. If we're going to fall. In other words, whenever something is dead, everything external of that something has absolutely no impact or effect on that something. Absolutely none. We cannot animate something that is dead. We cannot influence something that is dead. When you and I are dead to sin, when you and I have given ourselves to the way of the cross, it means that sin and the enemy have absolutely no impact on us. So you heard me talking with the kids and I was saying to the kids that we have to learn to say no. And we have to learn to say no to ourselves. Because the things that self wants, if we follow self, if we really, really follow self, we're all, first of all, we're all inherently selfish. Is there anyone inside here who is not selfish? I am being bold enough to make that accusation of every single person gathered here and listening to me that we are all inherently selfish. We all have the need to preserve self. It's just basic human instinct to survive. That's just who we are. And our selfishness says that we do not want to feel any kind of discomfort, any kind of pain, any kind of suffering. We want to avoid all of those things. That's what, that's what we say. So if there's anything that is going to put us into a place where we are uncomfortable, where we are in pain, where we are suffering, our natural tendency is to avoid that is to avoid that. But sometimes in following Jesus, we have to learn to say no to self. For the scripture says that the flesh or self desires what is contrary to what the Spirit of God desires. And what God desires for us is that we be formed and formed fashioned after Jesus Christ himself. So, in closing, if we are going to follow Jesus the way Jesus calls us to follow him, then Jesus says that we must deny self. In other words, to not allow oneself to enjoy things or to have things one wants. To not allow oneself to enjoy things or to have things one wants. That's how the Merriam-Webster Dictionary def defines denial of self. Denying self is an essential part of the Christian life. And Jesus calls upon those who wish to be his followers to reject the natural human inclination to gratify the desires of the human nature. Now the Dictionary of the Bible themes puts denying self this way. It says it is the willingness to deny oneself possessions or status in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. The purpose of denying self is to become more like Jesus in holiness and obedience to God. Denying self includes overcoming the persistent earthly demands of the flesh, also known, known as the carnal nature or the carnal self. And those who belong to Christ, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, have crucified self with its passions and its desires. Denying self 
for the disciple of Jesus Christ means renouncing oneself as the center of one's own existence and recognizing that Jesus is the true center of all our existence. It is to this end that we are called to follow Jesus during this time of Lent. Recognizing that those who follow Jesus will be opposed by a world that is opposed to God. Those who follow Jesus will be shamed by a world that is ashamed of Christ. Those who follow Jesus will suffer at the hands of a world that does not desire to live the way of Christ. And those who follow Jesus will face death. First, spiritual death. A dying to self that we might become alive in Jesus Christ. May we follow this path as Jesus calls us to do so. In the name of God who is Father, God who is Son, and God who is Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response then, Take Up Your Cross, Voices United, number 561. Let us turn to our God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Artists of souls, you sculpture the people for yourself out of the rocks of wilderness and fasting. Help us as we take up your invitation to prayer and simplicity that the discipline of these 40 days may sharpen our hunger for the feast of your holy friendship and whet our thirst 
for the living water you offer through Jesus Christ. God of grace, Creator God, we pray for a new awareness of the earth. May we search mountains and cross rivers with a new understanding of our role to care for every earthly good and gift. God of grace, compassionate God, hunger and poverty are very real in our world. And we know your heart grieves. Who can make a difference anyway? Who knows if the resources get to the right people? Forgive us when our ears become deaf to the needs around us. And forgive us when we turn away from the homeless and the work of finding a home for everyone. You are with the homeless. May we follow you there. God of grace, yeah. eternal God, we pray for all who govern and hold positions of authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us leaders for these days who are less interested in being powerful and more interested in being caring and doing right. Give us hope. God of grace, loving God, we give you thanks for Ebenezer and for the people around us with whom we work and share our daily lives. Show us what we can do to help them and teach us to be good neighbors and friends. God of grace, forgive us when we allow our discomfort to distance us from others. We lift to you all who are sick or in need of healing or comfort. Michelle Gillette, Cyril Harvey, Joseph Salins, Glenn and Ina's friends, Keith Wiley, Pat and Norman Manahan, Kevin Cotian, Godwin's nephew, K. Banks, Joyce Ovens, Tanya's friend, Jenna, Mary's brother, Basil, and sister, Kathy, Joseph's relatives in Ukraine, and we pray for Beverly in the loss of her aunt recently, and for all those we name in silence. God of grace, grant, O oh God, that the prayers we offer may be your channel for new and abundant life, not only hope for, but work for, through faithful word and deed. Amen.
Jesus challenged his followers to deny themselves in order to follow him. Our offerings express to God our willingness to give, not just a little something, but to commit resources we could have used in other ways for God's purposes instead. We are blessed to be able to give. And the stewardship second is, too often we get stuck in the muck of human things, doom scrolling, worrying about possessions, fretting over appearances. Jesus tells Peter and us to set our mind to the divine, generosity and prayer, Bible study and sharing faith, loving service and worship. We can act as servants and spend our time and resources making the world better for all. Our offerings will now be received. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you challenge all your followers to give to God like you did without counting the cost. Receive our gifts and bless them so that they may continue your ministry of healing in this hurting world. Bless us with your courage so our lives speak to others of our love for you and for them. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. And as we remain standing, our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
receive the benediction. As we now bring this time of worship to a close, we turn our eyes to the Lord. For the God who sent Jesus Christ to save the world will never leave us or forsake us. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort our hearts by the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit and establish us in every good work and word. Go with God, my friends. Amen.